we're doing something special today. I'm excited because on Mother's Day, sometimes I, sometimes I preach on Mother's Day, but sometimes I like to bring in guest speakers because I think it's appropriate and it's nice for us to hear uh, from other people. And on Mother's Day, specifically, a godly mother. I wanted you to hear from a godly mama that can speak to the church about whatever the Lord has put on her heart. And uh, it may not be a Mother's Day message. This may be a message to the whole church. But this, I guarantee you, is a godly mother. She is the director of our women's ministries. And some of you have heard her speak before. She's fired up. I've been in the back room with her. And she's got fire popping off her heels back there. I mean, she is ready to go. And I want you to welcome her to the stage and make her feel welcome. I know you know her and you love her. You see her up here all the time. But today she's going to be bringing you the word. Miss Dina Sanders, amen. Come on up here, Dina. <clears throat> Dina's got, she's got her amen corner right here. Her daughter Emily and her husband Brent right on the front row. You should be, you should be set up and ready to go. Oh, good catch. <laughs> you better turn it off because they will. <laughs> All right, God bless you. Wow, that was an introduction there, so thank you so much. So good morning, Trinity Fellowship. How is everyone doing? I'm so glad to be here today. Happy Mother's Day to all my beautiful mothers out here today. Uh, when Pastor D, he, when he first asked me to speak, it was an easy yes for me. I, I won't say necessarily easy yes, but I knew that it was time that God had been preparing me. And so what an honor to be up here to speak to everyone today. It truly is an honor, and I know I am called to this. I am my, one of my spiritual gifts is I am a shepherd, but I am also, I know that I am anointed to teach God's word, and so it truly is an honor, and I enjoy it. But I will tell you that <laughs> I, you put a guitar in my hand, and I am good to go. I love to play my guitar, but you put a microphone in my hand, and I am out of my comfort zone, so you just bear with me if I have to start reading my notes, it's just because I'm afraid, but I think I'm ready, I think I'm good to go, but I, I'm excited and scared all at the same time, but it's good, it's a good, it's a good thing, because I, I take this very seriously, and I know, Pastor D, that you don't just turn your pulpit over to just anyone and trust just anyone with your pulpit. I've been coming to Trinity for 10 years and I can count the guest speakers on my hands. And so I, I take that very seriously. So thank you. It's, it truly is an honor to be here. Uh, those of you who know me, you know I was, and if you don't know me, I was born and raised in Alabama. So when you hear me speak, you're going to hear some deep southern roots coming out of me. So I just wanted to warn you firsthand that I am country, so you're going to hear some southern stuff coming out, and I hope that that's okay. <laughs> uh, but before I get started, I want to open this up in prayer. So if everyone, would you please bow your heads with me as I pray. Lord, thank you, Jesus. Lord, I already feel your presence this morning. Lord, I prayed up I mean, from the first, when the first day that Pastor D asked me if I would speak today, Lord, you had already been preparing me to deliver this word and this message that you had given me. And so, Lord, I thank you first. I thank you first that you have called me for such a time as this, this appointed divine time. And I am so grateful and so honored. And I give you the glory, Jesus. Because this isn't about me, God. This is about you. This is your word, Father. And I thank you for this word. I thank you for the fire. The fire of the Holy Spirit. And that mantle that is resting upon my shoulders that you have given me. This gift, Lord, that I am using that today, Jesus. And I thank you for that. And Lord, I pray over every single person in this house, Lord that they will hear your word and that they would open their minds and their, and their heart and their spirit to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying today. And I thank you, Lord, and I praise you. And I pray and bind up all distractions and hindrances in the name of Jesus. And I give you all the praise and honor. In Jesus' holy name I pray, amen 
and amen. All right, so we're ready. So the title of my message today is called Time for Some Spring Cleaning. <laughs> and sometimes I have a hard time titling my sermons because, the, do you ever have a hard time titling your messages, Pastor D? Sometimes? I, I when I... I get so excited because there's so many messages inside my message that I tend to kind of get distracted. But I did. I, I prayed and I landed, and that was my, my title that I came up with. And I think it's very fitting, and it goes along with the Scripture. And I love Stephen Furtick from Elevation Worship. And I heard him say one time that he actually doesn't even title his messages until he's walking up to the pulpit. And I thought, wow, that's, that's, that's cool. But I didn't do that. I've got mine picked out. So I, my title is uh, Time for Some Spring Cleaning. And as Pastor D said, uh, we're not about tradition here. And this is not a traditional feminine Mother's Day message for the mothers. This is a message for everyone. And so as I tell the, the ladies who come to our TF Women meetings, I tell them all the time, I'm all about a message that is going to challenge you and get you out of your comfort zone. And that's the kind of messages, messages that I like. And, I, and I'll tell you, if, if anything I say today makes you uncomfortable, good. That's what I want. I want this message to challenge you, and I hope that it does. And if it steps on your toes, then good. But I'll just tell you, it stepped on mine first. Because whenever he gives me a word, it's always I apply it to myself first. Because I'm not going to stand up and preach a word that I'm not going to apply to myself personally. So I just want you to know that. So our, let's get started. I have a lot to unpack here, so you just get along and go for the ride. Um, so my, the highlight of my scripture today, I'm going to be teaching from 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, you can follow along with me, and then I re, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Um, Rio, it's time for slide number two, please, sir. I love Rio. He's so sweet. There we go. Thank you. All right, ready? Second uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Now, when, I, when, I, when the Lord gave me this message and I started studying it, let, I want you to look at something. So Paul was telling us a couple of things here in this scripture. He's saying, you've got a great house, right? You've got a great house and you've got it going on in that house. And he said, in that house... You have a wide variety of things. Now, I want you to think of spiritual things, okay? He says, you've got some things over here that are useful, that are honor the honorable things, right? But he's saying, you've got some things over here that are dishonorable. And he said, these are the things that you need to get rid of, Right? He's saying you've got some things that are useful, but you've also got some things that aren't useful, and you need to get rid of those things. And I thought, wow, what not that a revelation? I want you to think about this for a minute, because it almost, to me, it kind of sounds like a fence dweller, right? It, it kind of sounds like somebody's got, they're, they're half in and, and half out, got one foot in and one foot out, right? That's what it says. It says, in this house, you've got some things over here that bring honor. But then he's saying, you've got some things over here that bring dishonor. And it's these things over here that you've got to get rid of. Amen? Now, I want you to look at this, this, this part right here. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, right? So now... You must cleanse yourself from the latter. All right? You must cleanse yourself. So he's not saying that Jesus is going to clean your house. 
right? He's not saying Pastor D is going to clean your house. He's not saying that Molly the maid is going to come clean your house. No, he is saying you are going to clean your house. He, he's saying, let's read it again. He's saying, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter. So now, that is a big if, right? And so, I think we should all start highlighting the word if in our Bibles. If. Why? Because to me, when I hear the word and I see the word if, I'm thinking that is requiring some action on my part to see a result. Right? If you confess your sins, he is faithful to forgive our sins. If. You have faith as small as a mustard seed. You can say to this mountain, move, and it will be moved from here to there, and nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So, if. He cleanses himself from the latter. He will be a vessel of honor. And so I think a lot of times we're just sitting and waiting for Jesus to change our situations. And he does. He does deliver us. But then a lot of times he's sitting waiting for us to change our situation. He's waiting for us to clean our own house. Amen? And is it really fair Is it really fair that we expect him to clean up after us for every single mess we make? Now, he does that. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that he doesn't deliver us because he does. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, where's that responsibility? Where's that accountability for us? We are to be responsible with the things of God that he gives us. Amen? And we have the power and the authority to do those things. And so I think sometimes... We need to clean our own mess. We need to clean out our closets. And I think everybody's got something in their closet, right, that needs to be cleaned out. And I think it's time today that we do some deep cleaning. That's what I'm here for. That's what God, this day that the Lord gave me to come up here today was about about that. Deep cleaning, spiritual cleaning, deep calls to deep. God's word works. But we got to work the word. We have to be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. And it could be some of the things that you're struggling with, right? Some of the things that you struggle with may be because you're not doing anything about it. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to get on anybody's toes here, but it's the truth. I'm speaking the truth today. Um so a lot of times we, we're just sitting and we're praying and we're praying and we're asking for God to help us. And a lot of times we can just help ourselves. Now, please, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that Jesus is not going to help you. That's not the message here. I'm just talking about being, being strong, being able to help yourself because you have to be able to do that. You have to be a responsible, mature Christian, and we should be. Amen? So let's read the verse 21 again. Here we go. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful for the master, and prepared for every good work. Okay. I want to ask you a few questions, and I want you to think about these, okay? Just I want you to kind of just sit here and think about it, okay? Are you... A vessel of honor. What does it mean to be vessels of honor? Would you consider yourself a vessel that is useful in God's kingdom? Does your family, your church family, your friends, your co-workers, do they consider you an honorable person? And here's one. What about just acquaintances in your life, like people that they don't necessarily know you personally, but they know you? What would they say about you? What what is their first impression of you? 
Does everything you do bring honor to the Lord? How are you bringing honor to the Lord? What does honor mean to you? The dictionary says that honor means it's a good name, public esteem, reputation, a showing of usually merited respect or recognition. And so as I was studying this this word, he took me back to the beginning of 2 Timothy. And Paul, Paul is my man. I love the Apostle Paul. He is my favorite in the Bible. But Paul, he gave us some pretty good examples of how to build on an honorable character. So I want us to back up a little bit, and we're going to start from the beginning of 2 Timothy. So we're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. All right, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who listed him as a soldier. And if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. And consider what I say that the Lord, consider what I say and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. So, this isn't a three-point sermon. (laughs) It's actually eight points, so I hope I don't lose anyone. <laughs> so here we go. So there were eight things that Paul was telling, telling Timothy here, and I thought they were just awesome things that we can all build on on becoming an honorable person that can be useful to Jesus. So we're going to start with the first one. Point number one, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So what does that mean? We have to be strong. Amen? And one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Amen? And so what that means is we are fighters. Right? We can't be a weak follower. We have to be strong. We have to be a fighter. And it takes hard work. And it takes discipline, and it takes training. Fighters fight, they don't give up. 1 Timothy 6, 12 says, fight the good fight of faith. And those people who know me, they know that I love my Alabama football. I am a huge Alabama football fan. The Crimson Tide, Roll Tide, everybody knows that that is my thing, right? And, but as much as I love the Alabama football, I love Coach Nick Saban. He is my hero. I just love him. He's just awesome. And I just love his passion. And, I mean, just seeing when he coaches and he's just, like, pacing up and down the sidelines like a caged lion and just how he gets just so passionate about his coaching. But he's also – the reason he's such a great coach is he actually – like, puts good morals into his athletes. Like, he, he's, I mean, obviously he's doing something right, right? And so I heard him in an interview one time, and I thought this was very powerful. And I know that's kind of weird quoting a coach, but, but listen to this. This is powerful. I mean, when I heard this, I've been applying this to myself. But he tells his, his athletes this. He says, you can have the pain of disappointment, or the pain of discipline, right? You can, have, you can either have the pain of discipline or you can have the pain of disappointment. So which one would you rather have? I mean, think about it. In other words, he's saying it's going to cost you something, right? It is going to cost you something. And whatever you, uh, you're going to reap whatever you sow, And I would much rather have the pain from my discipline, knowing that I have built something stronger, that I'm giving birth to something 
strong, right? That my, my works and my labors are not in vain, right? It's going to cost you something. It's not going to be easy. But I would much rather do with that than to deal with the pain of disappointment in myself, having regret, shame, failure, guilt, all the things that the enemy does, right? I would much rather have the pain of discipline. All right, point number two, 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verse 2. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So I want to focus on commit these to faithful men. Who is in your circle? All right? Some of this need to think about who we're hanging out with, who we're talking to, who we're getting our counsel from, right? Are we surrounding ourselves with the right people? Because remember, Paul was telling Timothy here that there are some things that, can, that bring dishonor in, their, in your life, right? So, and sometimes that can be people, right? 2 Corinthians six seventeen says, come out from among them, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. Now, I don't want to get off track here, but I do want to talk about the word commitment just for a minute, okay? Because we are never going to learn to commit to, to the Lord and to our callings until we actually learn what commitment means, right? So I want to ask you some more questions. What is your level of commitment to your relationship with Jesus? What is your level of commitment to your family? What's your level of commitment to your church? What's your level of commitment to your job? What's your level of commitment to your friendships? Because however much time that you invest is what you're going to get out of it. Amen? And as I was, I was actually, I wanted to talk about commitment to the family just for a minute. I, I asked Emily, because my daughter Emily, she's a school teacher. She teaches third grade. And I asked Emily, I said, Emily, what, were some of the, what are some of the things that you see as a teacher about your children and, and their home lives? And she said, Mom, honestly, the two things that, that she sees the most of is screen time and attention. Lack of attention from home. So in other words, these children are spending way too much time on their electronics, right? And they're not getting enough time from their parents. And that's sad. That's a sad reality. So what I'm going to speak to my parents today. What's your level of commitment to your children? Husbands, what's your level of commitment to your wives? When's the last time that you prayed out loud with your wife? Hmm? When's the last time, wives, that you prayed out loud with your husband? What's your level of commitment to your family? Because those things are important. Those are strong values, and I think they're so important. Amen? All right, point number three. I'm going to try to keep going here. 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verse number 3. You, therefore, must endure hardship. Here again, it's not going to be easy, people. It's going to get harder. We are definitely living in the end times, and it is not going to be easy, right? So we got to toughen up. We got to stop whining and complaining, right? I'm guilty. I'm guilty. <laughs> I'm guilty. My family knows that. I, I can do some whining, but I always bring myself back around. We got to stop whining and complaining. Have gratitude instead of attitude. Amen. Hey, how about this one? Can we start living, stop living as victims and start living in victory? Why do we walk around with a victim mentality all the time? We're not victims. We're victors. Right? So can we, can we do that? And let's, let's talk about this for a minute. Why the whole purpose of the Israelites getting stuck in the desert? was because of their whining and their complaining and their grumbling. And, and, and here's, here's the bad part. 
They were complaining and whining over what God had given them and done for them. And it wasn't good enough. Wow, I don't want to be in that place. I'm going to my promised land. Amen? And, and, it's, and what's really bad is they had gotten so deep into that, that place of, of not being grateful of what God was doing from them. They just wanted to go back to Egypt and die. That's what they said. They said, we'll just go back. I want to go back in slavery. I want to go back in bondage. That's crazy. Right? That's a crazy mentality. So I think we just need to toughen up. We just got to toughen up. Right? And I think anybody, I love Paul, and I think if anybody in the Bible other than Jesus knew about suffering, it was Paul. Paul, Paul went through some stuff, right? I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians. I'm actually reading out of God's Word. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, is verse 3 through 5. We don't give people any opportunity to find fault with how we serve. Instead, our lives demonstrate that we are God's servants. We have endured many things, suffering, distress, anxiety, beatings, imprisonments, riots, hard work, sleepless nights, lack of food. Verse 6, people can see our purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives, our sincere love, truthfulness, and the presence of God's power. And we demonstrate that we are God's servants as we are praised and dishonored, as we are slandered and honored, as we use what is right to attack what is wrong and to defend the truth. We are treated as dishonest, although we are honest, as unknown, although we are well known, as dying, although, as you see, we go on living. We are punished. But we are not killed. People think we're sad, although we're always glad. And that we're beggars, although we make many people spiritually rich. That we have nothing, although we possess everything. So I want to read this part again. We do not give people an opportunity to find fault with how we serve. Instead, our lives demonstrate that we are God's servants. So think about that a minute. So when things get hard, right, when when the tough, we got to keep going, right? But when people see us, keep in mind, guys, as a Christian, people are watching you. People are watching us. And if they see us falling apart and complaining and and acting like we do sometimes, what does that say about who, what we're doing here? Got to toughen up. People are watching. Amen? All right, here we go. Next one. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 3. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And how do you become a good soldier? From training. But you have to learn to outsmart the enemy, right? You have to stay alert at all times. You have to be strategic. And you know what a good soldier has? A good battle plan. Amen? We have to be ready to go to battle. Proactive. You can't, if you're waiting to fight the enemy after he's attacked you, it's almost too late. I mean, it's never too late, but I mean, you better be ready. You got to stay on guard. And a good soldier does not get distracted. One of my favorite stories in the Bible, I'm going to read it real fast, but it's from Nehemiah. I love Nehemiah. Read Nehemiah, a four story. It's chapter 4, verse 1. But so it happened, listen to this, listen how the devil works, it's so crazy. But it so happened when Sam Ballot heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. So imagine that, the devil getting mad when you start doing something for the Lord, here he comes. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria, and he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish? Stones that are burned. Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him. And he said, well, whatever they build, even if a fox goes up on it, 
He will break down their stone wall. Doesn't that sound like the enemy? Wow. So, so, listen to this. We built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. And now it happened when Samballot, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were, being, were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. But nevertheless, listen to this, church. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God. And because of them, we set watch against them day and night. And in verse 17, it says, Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves. You hear that? Loaded themselves so that, that with one hand they worked at the construction and the other hand they held their weapon. And every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built. And the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. So you know what? They were ready, right? They were ready. They had a battle plan. And it said that they had their minds set to it, that they prayed, right? They prayed, and they had their weapon in their hand. Now, what is your weapon? What's your weapon? Thank you. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. For the, the weapons we fight with are not carnal, for they have the power to, destroy, to demolish strongholds. And no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That's your weapon right there. Amen? So we got to be ready. Being a good soldier means that you are ready for the enemy. Amen? All right, 2 Timothy, next one. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 4. No one in t engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a good soldier. So, we are to please him. All right? Are we living to please him? That is our whole purpose. And Paul said, hey, I'm not here to please man. I'm here to please God. Galatians 1.10 says, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. And so I think sometimes we bring dishonor to ourselves because we're too busy trying to please man or trying to please ourselves. I mean, that's where sin is birthed, right? Sin is birthed when we're trying to do what we want to do. But that's not, what, that's not the plan. We have to do what pleases God first. Amen and amen. Okay. I, was, I wanted to read this little part of Timothy. Um, 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 17 says, Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. Approved to God. Pleasing to God. Amen. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, and to shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. So do you see that open door there? Do you see how once you've opened the door to that, how it just keeps snowballing? And that's what it says. It says it will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. So you need to be asking yourself this daily, is what I'm saying and what I'm doing pleasing God? That's a good check right there. Is what I'm doing and what I'm saying pleasing to God? Next point, 2 Timothy 2.5. And if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. All right, I'm going to leave that right there. 
We have to be obedient. Right? We have to be obedient. We have to follow the rules. And obedience just speaks for itself. You have to obey. And I'm just going to tell you, I wrote this in my notes. It's very simple. Obedience is very, very simple. You know, you think of obedience, that it's like this long list of things that you have to do, right? Obedience is you are just simply, you obey the Holy Spirit even if you don't feel like it. Even if your emotion doesn't feel like it, that's not what you're being driven by. You are being driven by the Holy Spirit. Amen? God's word, John 14, 21 says, Whoever knows and obeys my commandments is the person who loves me. And those who love me will have my Father's love, and I too will love them and show myself to them. So if you want to see God move more in your life, are you obeying the Holy Spirit? And Paul is telling Timothy here, you're not going to win the prize until you follow the rules first. And I think a lot of times people, that's the problem, people want to receive the reward, but they don't want to do what it takes to get that reward. So just think about that for a minute. All right, next, next point, point number seven. Getting close. <laughs> Second Timothy 2.6, the hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. So we have got to be a hard worker, Right? We have to be sowers. We've got to plow the field, right? We've got to do some planting. Jesus said in Luke 10, 2, he said, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So we have to be hard workers. I'm going to read you some Proverbs about laziness and when I read these I started laughing I was like wow that person I hope I'm not I hope I'm never these people all right the desire of the lazy man kills him for his hands refuse to labor as a door turns on its hinges so does the lazy man on his bed (laughs) he has a slack hand becomes poor but the hand of the diligent makes rich Laziness cast one into a deep sleep, and an idle person will suffer hunger. The lazy man will not plow because of winter. He will beg during the harvest, and he will have nothing. And the way of the lazy man is like a hedge of thorns, but the way of the upright is a highway. So we need to be more, we have to work hard, people. Got to be hard workers. Amen. All right, 2 Timothy, last point here. 2 Timothy 2, 7. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. So what he's saying, we got to have more wisdom, right? We got to get more wisdom. And where does that wisdom come from, right? But here's the key. You've got to be sure. You've got to make sure that you're listening you're listening to his voice. You got to make sure that you can hear his voice, right? Jesus said in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. James 1, 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who will give it liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. All right? So I'm going to give you a little fast, fast little mini sermon in my sermon here. I do a daily check on myself, and I've heard Pastor D say this many, many times. And people have, people have asked, often asked me that people who know me know that I am a prayer warrior. I love to pray. That is one of my, my strongest gifts is being a prayer warrior. And I've heard people they ask me like, Miss Dina, how do you do that? How do you pray? Like, what do you do? And so I've heard that in the Bible before. Didn't the disciples ask Jesus, how do you pray? Teach us how to pray, Jesus. And you know what he said? He gave them the Lord's Prayer, right? And so if you do anything, this is where your wisdom comes from. 
You know, yes, it's the word of God gives us wisdom. Obviously, his word, the Bible, you know, and then obviously being in church, getting taught, getting fed, that's wisdom. Surrounding yourself with mentors and fellowship with other believers, that's wisdom. With our friends, that's wisdom. Amen, right? But you want real wisdom from the Holy Spirit. You've got to be able to hear his voice and have a direct line of communication with him on a daily basis to be able to hear him, right? And if you will pray this prayer, if you will pray, the, if you can't pray anything else, if you will pray the Lord's Prayer every single day, it covers all the bases. He co- it covers it all. My Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. You're starting it off. You're addressing him with the Lord's Prayer. You're addressing him with praise. Thanks. Come to his gates with thanksgiving and praise. Amen. Hallowed be thy name. Let your kingdom come, Lord. Let your will be done in me as it is in heaven. Give me, Lord, my daily bread. You are my daily bread. You are my daily bread. Fill me up today, Jesus. Fill me with your word today, Lord. I'm hungry. Fill me up, Lord. Feed me. Forgive me of my sins. Repentance. Forgive me of my sin. You you pray, repent every day. What are the things in the way, Lord, that I need to that I need to get better? Repentance, repentance, daily repentance. And then forgive others who've sinned against me. That's going to cover any offenses because we get offended. People hurt our feelings. If you do that, you're, you're covering all the bases. Forgive me as I forgive those who have sinned against me. Protect me. Lead me not into temptation. Help me, Lord, to not be so tempted to keep messing up every day, keep messing everything up that I do. Right? Lead me away from temptation, Lord. Deliver me from evil. And then you're ending it. You're starting it off praising him, and then you're ending it praising him. For you are the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen? And amen. So there's your wisdom right there. If I have spoken anything today, if you will follow that every single day, I promise you, you're going to hear his voice. He's going to speak to you through all of that. Because, why? Because that's what he said do. That's what Jesus said. Pray this. When the disciples asked him, that's what they, that's what he told them to do. All right, quick review here. So we're going to, we're going to be strong. We're going to be committed. We're going to endure hardships. We're going to be good soldiers. We're going to please God and not man. We're going to walk in obedience, be hard workers, and get more wisdom. And I'm going to review the scripture one more time. Here we go. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be vessels of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Now, Paul says to be a vessel of honor, you're sanctified. All right? Sanctification, that means you are set apart. Right? We're set apart, but we're useful. We're useful, and we're prepared. So, you're spring cleaning and bringing it back around. So, what does a clean house look like? And there's three other things, and I'm going to go real quick. He gave me accountability, got accountability, responsibility, and availability. Being sanctified and set apart means you have to be more accountable for your actions. And being set apart means that you live with conviction on a daily basis. And the only way you can do that is through the Holy Spirit. And because He's the one that's going to keep you accountable, right? And He's the one who's going to tell you when you're getting off track. And then the other thing, responsibility. Are we responsible with the things that God gives us? Are we being good stewards? And if we're going to be useful in God's kingdom, we have to be responsible. And if you want God to give you more, if you want God to give you more, are you being responsible with what he's already given you? Are you? And last, this is the most important to me. This is me right here. Availability. Availability, in order for God to prepare you, 
Are you making yourself available? Right? Because, look, God, he doesn't use the same faulty, inconsistent, and complacent mindset of the world. He is not looking. Let's write this down if you're taking notes. He is not looking for your accomplishments. He's looking for your availability. Okay? The world is teaching us to conform. Everything around us, everything we hear and see on social media, everywhere we go, the world is trying to teach us to conform to the world. But Jesus is teaching us to be transformed. Amen? Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed, right? Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so as we become vessels of honor, something that's useful, something that's useful, right? He's going to call us. That means, you know what that means? You're being called to a higher, higher level of purpose. And if you're not being called, if, you know, we got to go, we have to go from glory to glory to glory to glory. Are you being called to a higher level of purpose? And what that requires of us, you got to have a radical mind shift. You got to have a radical mind shift. Because what that means, if you're going to get to that place, you have to be a willing vessel. You have to be willing to leave your comfort zone to access your glory zone. You got to be ready. You got to be a willing vessel. You got to be willing to get out of the boat. That's what Peter. Get out of the boat. If you want to access your glory zone, you got to get out of that comfort zone. Amen? So in closing, I'm going to ask you one more final question. And I'm here to tell you, stand up here today and call it out that's not my job I could stand up here and I could name it all I have discernment he said Dina that's not your job that's my job that's what he told me and so the, the day the day that he asked me to speak I, you know what I did I started praying for you for all of you. And there's nothing more that would bless me today to see some people cleaning their houses up. Because people carry so much stuff. They carry so much stuff. So I'm asking you today, I'm asking, please be honest with yourself. Please be honest. What are, what are those things that you need to get rid of? Because I know that, that you have some. And the reason I know that is because he told me. He gave me this message. Why, he gave me this message so that I know that God's not a liar, obviously, you know. So I'm going to ask you this. What do you need to get rid of? Today is your day. Please make quit putting it off. That's what he said. He said, people just keep on doing this stuff. Why? Why? He said, lay it down. Let it go. Don't be afraid. This is a safe place here. It's a safe place. And he said, you can't pour. He said, you cannot pour new wine. 
to an old wineskin. You have to be a willing vessel. And it comes, that, that part of that it becomes being accountable, being willing to say yes to the Holy Spirit. So I ask the worship team to come up. They're going to play us a song. I'm going to be down here. And if you want me to pray for you, I would love to do that. But I want you to come down. If there's something that I said today that spoke to you, and you know what that you know what it is. You already know. It's not me. It's not me. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that's working on you and is asking you to let these things go. Because remember, you've got this house. You've got you've got these things over here that are useful. But you've got these things over here. This plate, this room over here. It's not going to work. This room right here that's bring dishonor, those are the things you've got to get rid of to move on, to move on. Amen. I thought Pastor D was going to preach that last week. I heard him say something about broken vessels, and I thought, and I already knew I had this, the vessel of honors. I already knew I had that, and he was talking about the broken vessels. But did you know did you know that that's temporary? You don't have to stay there. That's a temporary condition. A broken vessel. Hey, we all get that way. We all get in those places sometimes. And it's okay. It's okay. I feel his anointing. Thank you Jesus. I feel it right now. I feel, I feel your spirit, Lord. I feel your sweet Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for that anointing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Lord, I'm asking you. Fill these people up today, God. Fill them up today, Lord. Give them that power, Lord. Give them that strength, God. Give them Give them this overwhelmingly desire to, to be an overcomer, not to be overcome with all the heaviness of the world, Lord, but to be overcome with your power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, you sweet, sweet Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. The worship team is going to lead us in this song. And again, the altars are open. And if you would like for me to pray with you, I would love I'd love to pray with you. And if there's more people, I'm asking my prayer warriors to come and help me out a little bit. Amen. Thank you. It's been an honor today. Thank you. Thank you.